Alrighty. Um, let's uh, have a quick word of prayer real quick. Lord, thank you for this. Uh, oh. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the Sabbath, uh, day of rest that you've given to us. Um, just uh, thank you for this time of worship today. And uh, we just thank you for all the blessings that you've given to us um, uh, with this Thanksgiving season coming up. Uh, just help us to be mindful of uh, giving our thanks to you and uh, um, the one who truly deserves uh, all the praise and all the thanks. And um, we just thank you for all the things that you have blessed us with in this nation. And uh, um, we again thank you for this day. Thank you for uh, all the folks who made it here safely today. And uh, just help us to have a good time in the Word. Amen. Alright, uh, the Torah portion today will be in um, Genesis chapter 25. And I'm going to start reading in uh, verse 19. And uh, I'll read through the end of the chapter there. Is this coming through okay out there? Alright. I would uh, ask that you please stand for the reading. Chapter 25 in Genesis, starting in verse 19. Um, this is the account of Abraham's son Isaac. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, daughter of Bethuel the Aramean from Padan Aram, and sister of Laban the Aramean. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. The Lord answered his prayer, and his wife Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled each other within her, and she said, Why is this happening to me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there was twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red. His whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was a quiet man staying among the tents. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country, famished. He said to Jacob, Quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm famished. That is why he was also called Edom. Jacob replied, First sell me your birthright. Esau said, Look, I'm about to die. What good is a birthright to me? But Jacob said, Swear to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Then uh, jump over to chapter 27. Uh, we're going to start at verse 26 and read through verse uh, 40. Um, then his father Isaac said to him, Come here, my son, and kiss me. So he went to him and kissed him. When Isaac caught smell of his clothes, he blessed him and said, Ah, the smell of my son is like the smell of a field. That must be a good thing that the Lord has blessed. May God give you of heaven's dew and of the earth's richness. An abundance of grain and new wine. May nations serve you and peoples bow down to you. Be Lord over your brother, brothers and may the sons of your mother bow down to you. May those who curse you be cursed and those who bless you be blessed. After Isaac had finished blessing him and Jacob had scarcely left his father's presence, his brother Esau came in from hunting. He too prepared some tasty food and brought it to his father. Then he said to him, My father, sit up and eat some of my game so that you may give me your blessing. His father Isaac asked him, Who are you? 
I am your son, he answered, your firstborn Esau. Isaac trembled violently and said, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? I ate it just before you came, and I blessed him, and indeed he will be blessed. When Esau heard his father's words, he burst out with a loud and bitter cry and said to his father, Bless me, me too, my father. <clears throat> Excuse me. But he said, Your brother came deceitfully and took your blessing. Esau said, Isn't he rightly named Jacob? He has deceived me these two times. He took my birthright, and now he has taken my blessing. Then he asked, Haven't you reserved any blessing for me? Isaac answered Esau, I have made him lord over you, and have made all his relatives his servants, and I have sustained him with grain and new wine. So what can I possibly do for you, my son? Esau said to his father, Do you have only one blessing, my father? Bless me too, my father. Then Esau wept aloud. His father Isaac answered him, Your dwelling will be away from the earth's richness, away from the dew of heaven above. You will live by the sword, and you will serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you will throw his yoke from off of your neck. Uh, you may be seated. Um, so, I want to kind of focus uh, today on this whole uh, birthright uh, deal here in uh, verse, um, around verse uh, 32, um, when Esau sold his birthright. Uh, and the, import the importance of the birthright uh, to the oldest son, it, it basically... It's the continuing down of the covenantal promise um, that was passed down to Esau uh, that it says he despised. He did not, um, he did not respect that and, and really grasp that and cherish that. Um, so he sold it to Jacob uh, for a bowl of stew. Um, I, I kind of see the... Uh, the birthright and the blessing here kind of going together. Um, I kind of, I see them kind of like, you know, the, the blessing and birthright were supposed to go to Esau. I kind of see them hand in hand um, there. And so with Esau uh, forsaking his birthright, um, you know, I also kind of see the birthright holding responsibility uh, with with that, um, the fact that you know the the covenantal promise started with Abraham down to Isaac, and it you know Esau had it, uh, but gave it up to um, Jacob. Uh, but you know, like I said, with with the birthright comes responsibilities. You know, I mean, the covenantal promise, uh, as we know, you know, God had specific rules on. You know how these people were to, were to live. Uh, I didn't read it, but in uh, chapter twenty-six, verse four, um, I'll just read it here. I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and will give them all these lands. And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed, because Abraham obeyed me and kept my requirements, my commands, my decrees, and my laws. Um, and, th and those are responsibilities uh, for us too, um, as followers. Of uh, so, so Esau, you know, it's obvious here that he he could care less about you know the birthright and uh, you know kind of the responsibility that goes with that. But uh, you know, as I read in chapter twenty-seven, he he definitely wanted that blessing, though. You know, so he kind of he kind of threw the the birthright deal at Jacob, but he wanted the blessing that kind of that kind of goes with that birthright. Um, we need to remember that uh, back in chapter 25, this this whole thing uh, that happened here, God told um, Rebecca that this was going to happen. You know, uh, we can look at Jacob and you know say, well, he kind of went about it the wrong way as far as acquiring this. Uh, this birthright, and he did. I mean, he was deceitful, but it, it it had to have worked out one way or the 
together, Esau, the Lord told um, Rebekah that Esau would serve his younger brother, that that was a fact that was going to happen. Um, and we also, you know, we also hear uh, that Jacob, you know, he's the trickster in all this, uh, you know, he tricked Esau and he did. Um, but I think there's a little, I think there's a little bit of uh, deceitfulness kind of running throughout this whole family here. For one, you know, Rebecca, she's like kind of instigated this whole thing, you know, hey, you know, Jacob, I heard, you know, this is situations going on, go trick your father kind of deal. He played along with it. But then with Esau also, you know, um, it seems like Isaac didn't know about this whole situation of uh, Esau giving his birthright because as I read um, in chapter uh, 27, um, trying to find the verse here. Anyways, uh, you know, he, he told Isaac, he said, uh, he's rightly so called Jacob. He tricked me twice, first with uh, the birthright and then with the blessing. Um, so in front of his father, you know, he's trying to make it sound like, you know, hey, like, he just tricked me, like, throughout. But, but we know for a fact he... He knew what he was doing when he gave his birthright to um, Jacob. He, you know that was something he was very aware of. Um, but he, you know, he just threw it out there like, "Oh, he tricked me twice," when that wasn't the case. So we see deceitfulness throughout this whole um, story here. Uh, also, want to read in Malachi. Um, you don't have to turn there. You can listen if you want. Uh, it's just five verses. Malachi chapter one. Um, an oracle of the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, but you ask, how have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, the Lord says? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau I have hated. And I have turned his mountains into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. Um, you know, I don't think Esau realize what uh, what effect this would have on his entire generation uh, it did it certainly didn't um, just affect him and uh, you know and, and take away his rights of having uh, the birthright and the blessing but his entire descendants after him were cursed because of that decision that he made um, I guess just to close this up, uh, you know, we learned from Esau that, uh, you know, he, he took his uh, birthright for granted. Um, that was something that he did not uh, appreciate. Um, and for us, you know, we need to, uh, we need to not take for granted the uh, responsibilities and the position that God has put us, has put us. Um, as being followers of God, you know, in a sense, we all have a birthright and uh, and a responsibility that um, we need to all carry out. Uh, you know, and that can go with, uh, you know, just with a physical sense, you know. Um, you know, kind of like the guys as leaders of the house, you know, we have a responsibility in the physical sense to take care of our families and so forth. Um, you know, it seems like nowadays, like a lot of, uh, men especially don't like to take care of those responsibilities. You know, they're always trying to run away from that and so forth. So uh, in, a, in a physical sense, but so then on also a spiritual sense, you know, and, and that goes with all of us. You know, we're called to be disciples and uh, to go out and preach the word. So um, that's what.
what I got for you. Uh, hopefully that helps you out. Pray. Father, thank you for today, for being with us and leading us and guiding us. Thank you for this Sabbath, and we just pray, Abba, that you would just, Father, fill our hearts with, with, just, with joy and peace and faith. And I pray, Father, that you would lead and guide me this day, too, as I share from your word. I pray, Lord God, that you would just uh, equip this, mold and shape us more into the image of your Son. We ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. I want to uh, start today by uh, revisiting the way I kind of began this series of talks that I've been doing on looking at uh, who we are uh, as a people, as Messianic believers. What does that mean? Now, there's a fundamental difference be, uh, between what I call uh, evangelical dispensationalism and what we as Messianics are. And, and basically, I think that a real critical aspect of that comes from the fact that we don't believe that the church began in Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. That that was not the birth of the church as typically taught among evangelical dispensationalists. That that was not the beginning of a new thing called Christianity and God was just scrapping out the old stuff. But that it was the empowerment of the church to continue in this work of restoration. So I've been talking about that. How do we all fit into that aspect? How do we all fit into this restoration work that's going on as messianics? And so to begin that, I just want to refresh how I kind of began this whole series with John, the Gospel of John chapter 11, and beginning in verse 45. And it says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what he did, Speaking about Jesus, this is talking about the, the raising of Lazarus from the dead. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. And if we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, named Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is, is expedient for you that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation should not perish. So this is Caiaphas speaking, and he's saying basically, this Yeshua out there, this Jesus is stirring up all kinds of problems, and what you don't realize is that it would be best for him to die than for his lies to spread and end up creating a situation that we all be put to death by the Romans. So just on a natural level, he's just, he's just uh, coming from the view that, look, I mean, if he's creating this kind of problem, let's just get rid of him. But what he doesn't know is this. Uh, let's see and that the whole nation should not perish. He did not say this of his own accord, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. Okay, so Caiaphas doesn't realize it, but when he says that it's best for this one man to die rather than the whole nation, he's prophesying. And yet not for this nation only, but to gather into one the scattered children of God uh, excuse me, gather into one the children of God who are scattered abroad. So from that day on, they took counsel how to put him to death. If you ask the average person, why did Jesus die on the cross? They'll probably tell you, well, he died for our sins. And amen to that. Praise God for that. But that's not the only reason he died on the cross. He also died on the cross to scatter into one, or to gather into one the scattered children of God. Now, from the book of Hosea, we learn who are those scattered children that he's speaking about. In Hosea, you can turn there, Hosea chapter 1, I'm just going to give you a summary of what's going on there. In Hosea, God calls 
the prophet Hosea, and he says, Hosea, this is this is the guy who gets he gets one of them kind of them raunchy jobs as a prophet. Okay, he's told by the Lord. Uh, Hosea, I want you to go out and I want you to marry a harlot. And I want you to have children of harlotry from her. Because when you do this, what's going to be happening in your life is a picture of what's happening with me and my relationship with Israel. So Hosea, he goes and he marries Gomer. And they begin to have children. And the very first one that he has, his name is Jezreel. Okay, the child's name is Jezreel, and basically this means to scatter, because God says I'm going to scatter them, but it's not a scatter for the pro for the for the probability and for the purpose of destruction, but that they might grow. Okay, now the second child was called Bu Rohama, which means not pity, because he says I'm not going to have pity on them, and then the last one was uh, lo ami, which means they are not my people, and I am not their God. So he's going to disown them. But at the end of this chapter in Hosea, it says, Yet the number of the people of Israel shall be like the sand of the sea, which can neither be measured nor numbered. And in the place where it is said to them, You are not my people, it shall be said to them, You are sons of the living God. And the people of Judah and the people of Israel shall be gathered together. Now, according to the Gospel of John, it says here that one of the reasons that Messiah died on the cross was to gather the 12 tribes of Israel back together again. That he was literally going to bring this about. Well, if we are not part of the 12 tribes of Israel... Where do we fall into this whole picture? The scripture teaches in Ephesians chapter 2 that we who put our faith in Israel's Messiah, Jesus, that we are in fact grafted into the commonwealth of Israel. That we actually become adopted sons and daughters of Israel. And Israel's past becomes our past. Israel's future becomes our future. We are grafted in and we become part of the commonwealth of Israel. It's much like when Israel followed, when, when the multitudes followed Israel out of Egypt. It says, when, e when Israel left Egypt, a mixed multitude went out with them because they had claimed the God of Israel. They had put their faith in the God of Israel. They had taken on the faith of Abraham. So anyway, I've just been sharing in these weeks kind of where we all fit into that and who we are as a people called by the living God and how that fits into our life. Now last week, well actually in the week before that, some of you have asked, you seem like something's kind of been bothering you, something's kind of been weighing down on you, and it's true, I have been struggling for some, some time seemed like last week it kind of peaked up a little bit. And it really wasn't the election results that bothered me a whole lot, although they did bother me. That wasn't the primary thing that, that's been bothering me for these weeks and so forth. And it really isn't the fact that, you know, that I believe that we have completely secured, socialized uh, national health care, all that goes with it, with the loss of religious freedoms that go along with that. It really isn't that. Although I will say that I am glad now, more than ever, that we have dropped our tax-exempt status. And maybe even that we'll need to pull away more in the future. You know, but that doesn't mean that we are to become quieter. No. In fact, we must speak louder. We must be louder and more uh, vocal about our faith. But that doesn't mean we also have to make ourselves a target. You know, just remember that the underground church is not hiding their light under a bushel. They're just using caution and sharing the gospel in uh, violent opposition that they have against them. You know, all the things that we've been hearing in the last couple of weeks about all the election results 
all that's going on and so forth with the budget and so forth. All these things are not the things that I'm struggling with. The struggle that I have is what I call the disconnect. The disconnect of, the pe of people who claim to be God's people, the disconnect of that and the things of morality and liberty. The fact that 80% in our nation claim to be Christian, and yet about 50% voted for an administration that promotes abortion, gay marriage, and less religious liberties. You know, it's amazing to me, even Catholics, you know, with all the issues that's been going on, with her, with her whole, with the whole faith of the Catholics, with all of that going on, 55% of Catholics voted for this current administration. What bothers me is the disconnect, the disconnect of God's people from the ways of God, from the Word of God, from the Spirit of God, from the Kingdom of God. I think this disconnect stems primarily from not understanding two things. What we were saved from and who we are. We were saved from breaking God's law and we are the children of God. Heirs, heirs of the promise. Heirs of his kingdom. In fact, the scripture says that we are kings and priests in his kingdom. I want to look at Galatians chapter 4. Please turn to Galatians chapter 4. And beginning at verse 1, it says, I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no better than a slave, though he is owner of all of the estate. But he is under guardians and trustees until the date set by the Father. So it is with us. When we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. But when the time had fully come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, so that we might receive adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent his spirit, excuse me, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So through God, you are no longer slaves, but a son. And if a son, then an heir. heir. As I said last week, or the week before, if we are heirs, then there has to be something to inherit. Is there not? There has to be something that we inherit. In Revelation 1, verse 5 and 6, read, To him who loves us and has washed us from our sins by his blood, and made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Some of the series that I've been going over here come from this book called Rediscovering the Kingdom. And I just want to read a short portion of that here. And it says... How important is the kingdom of God? It is so important that our lives depend on it, literally. All that we do, excuse me, all that we are, all that we see and do and hear, the air we breathe, the food we eat, the water we drink, this physical world of ours issued forth from the kingdom of God by his hand at creation. The kingdom of God is at the center of everything. God's every action and activity is motivated by his desire and passion 
to see his kingdom established on earth. How important to the body of Christ is the message of the kingdom of God? Frankly, we have nothing else to preach or teach. The message of the kingdom is good news, and the church exists to proclaim it. If we are doing our job, everything we are about will be kingdom-focused. Every sermon we preach, every Bible study we teach, every ministry we perform, every activity we accomplish, and every worship service we celebrate. The kingdom of God must be our highest priority. And I say amen to that. Uh, you know, we've been looking, as I said, this whole issue of these different aspects of how God's kingdom relates to us and how we relate to that kingdom that we are awaiting as a future coming and yet as a kingdom that's here and now in, in some sense. And we've been talking about, as we relate to that kingdom, we've been talking about the fact that the scripture says that we are kings and priests in that kingdom. See, we serve a mighty God and we serve King Messiah and it's, we, have all, we have earthly examples of all of these things. When Nebuchadnezzar came and took Jerusalem, it says that he took some of the greatest and the noblest of all the people to be his servants. Because who was going to be the, ser the servants to King Nebuchadnezzar? Not the lowliest of the earth, but the most prominent of the earth. And who is going to serve the king of kings except for kings and priests? So that's what he has called us into. That's what he has called us to be about. He has set this before us. And, he, and as I talked about a few weeks back, we have been dubbed kings and priests. Unfortunately for some, being dubbed isn't enough. Some have to be rub-a-dub-dubbed or something like that before we can realize the fact that the call that we have on our life has very little to do with us. Do you realize that? You didn't choose him. He chose you. You didn't make that choice originally that, I'm, you know what, I've done enough. I'm gone far enough. I'm going to give my life to God. Did you make that literal choice? Yes, you did. But not with the Spirit of God entering into your heart and giving you that, that, that spirit of repentance. Because without the Spirit of God moving in the heart of, of people, there is no repentance. There is no coming to Him. We remain dead in our sins. But he who loved us called us before we were ever born to be in his marvelous kingdom. That's good news. That's great. And that's why we're here. That's what this is all about. Our position as kings and priests, it's because of the work of the Messiah. That's how and why we hold this position. But we must claim it. We must train ourselves and our children as kings in that kingdom. And that training needs to begin now. This disconnect has to stop. The people of God have to reconnect with God. It needs to happen with all of us. Dads, moms, children, in the home, at school, at work, and out in the world. Last time I told you that I was going to share an earthly example to kind of give us a little guidance of what I'm talking about. So I have an earthly example for you, and is it the most perfect example? No. What's the best one I could come up with? It's also one that this author used, and I just kind of tweaked it and kind of put it into perspective of where we're coming from. Prince William and his younger brother, Harry, are sons of Prince Charles, the future king of England. Their mother was the late Diana. And from their birth, they have been heirs to the throne. They were raised accordingly and were raised accordingly. And I've just been kind of thinking over the last couple of weeks about this whole issue of William and Harry being born, and at the time of their birth, they're heirs 
to a throne. Now with that said, from their birth then, it was realized that they were not regular common children. They weren't of the regular common children of their day. And that they would someday be kings. When Charles is no longer the king, William will be the king. And when he's no longer the king, well, Charles isn't the king yet. When his mother dies, he will become the king. I believe that's how it works. And then, uh, then his sons will follow him in that. I believe that that's true because I don't believe that their father, uh, Charles's father, was a king. I think that the royalty comes through Elizabeth, I believe. I don't know how all that works anyway. They're not kings, they're princes. But they could be kings one day, and will be. And that this call on their life came from infancy, from the time they were born. And that when they were little, they were told who they were. Now, they could choose to take that and become arrogant and filled with pride, or they could come to realize the real role of a king is to serve, like our king came to do. How that would all be shaped was up to them, but they would be told who they were. They would be taught how to be kings. They would be taught how to walk. Kings walk a certain way. They have a certain walk to them. They would be taught how to talk. Certain language befits that of a king. How to think. How to behave toward others. Basically, as Tevia says, they had traditions for everything. How to eat, how to sleep, how to wear clothes. And uh, so these two boys, as they were being brought up, were taught all these things that would pertain to them as being kings one day. They were taught what they could watch because they wanted to make sure the right propaganda was going into them. They were taught what they would listen to and who from, and who their friends, what their friends would be like, what their spouse must be like, and what their social life must be like. From infancy, I'm sure these two <clears throat> were molded and shaped <clears throat> by all of those things. And even now, being a future king of either one of them encompasses everything about them. Every decision that they make in life must be filtered through the realization of who they are. In short, they were chosen, and they are not their own. Their future is set, and they will be kings. And yet, even now, they are royalty as they wait that. Now, this was the earthly example that I wanted to set forth because I believe that we can learn from this worldly example that we have here of the kings of earth. Now, the, the Lord said that his kingdom was not of this wor or world. This was when he, just before he was to be crucified, and he said, because if it was of this world, my people would have fought for me. But he says, my kingdom is not of this world. Does that mean that he is not king and lord right now? No, he's not, is he? He, in fact, is owner and maker of this world that we live in. What he's talking about is his kingdom is not of this world, meaning it's not of this system. This system is not his kingdom. And yet he's king, he's lord, he's ruler of all. There's nothing that happens that he does not allow to happen. He is sovereign in every way. And it's kind of interesting, you know, all the things that are going on with the whole storm out west and so forth, the whole 9-11 thing, this Benghazi thing that's going on in the news, all this business. You know, I've been hearing different people speak on these things, and everyone is real slow to say that God's judging America. 
Well, I even heard one pastor say, well, God never sends trials and tribulations on his people. He never sends, he never sends devastation. That isn't from God. Well, you know what? God is sovereign. God, God is who he is. And, you know, despite, you know, the fact that our God is a loving God, I do believe that he is getting America's attention. I do believe that there is chastisement coming to America because of this disconnect that I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, it talks about if you obey me, these are the blessings that you can expect. If you disobey me, these are the curses you can expect. Okay, so God is sovereign in all of that. In fact, the, the, the issue is that I think that is so often missed when we bring up the fact that is God chastising us as a nation? I believe, yes, I, yes, yeah, that's what you will hear from this person, is that God is, in fact, chastising this nation. Is it because he hates us? Is it because he doesn't like us no more? No, it's because he loves us. And if we can get that understanding, maybe we won't cast off this idea so quickly that God's trying to get our attention for the good. But instead we'd say, oh, no, no, we believe in a loving God. We believe in a God who would never do these kinds of things because I heard that very statement made this week that if there was, from the atheist group, that if there was a loving God, things like Hurricane Sandy just couldn't happen because in some places the devastation is, is horrendous. Well, their thoughts is, if God is so loving, this couldn't happen. So there is no loving God. The fact is, they don't know God. And they don't know that he is, in fact, a loving God. Because why? Because God would rather stir us up a little bit here on earth and break some buildings down and so forth and do some flooding if the overall, if the overall thing will get our attention and draw us back to him. Draw us back to the most important things the things that are unseen rather than the things that are seen, the things that we build that are susceptible to the destructions of the world. It's this disconnect of who we are that concerns us and how we need to, we need to reconnect. We need to reconnect as a people, not only as a culture, but as a people. But as messianics, this is where, this is where we need to be able to to, to, to grab a hold of what God is doing. He is in a process of restoration. That's what he is doing. And I believe that he began it with the Reformation movement. As imperfect as those guys were, he began that work of restoration. Now we are the ones who are alive today. What will we do with it? Will we take God's word and will we apply it? Will we take his word and his laws and make them a part of our makeup so that we can be a light and a testimony to the world? That's the call. And who we are in that is vital to us accomplishing that, especially in the days to come. I believe it's us knowing and having a good foothold on who we are in Him that's going to carry us through the days that we're going to be facing in the near future. As I said, I believe we can learn from this earthly example because like those boys, we are not regular common children of humanity. Now, I'm going to go through these today and then next week I want to start by zeroing in on each of these for the directions that the scripture gives us. Today I just want to go through these and just kind of put these thoughts into your mind, let you kind of work on them through the week. Like them... We are not regular, common children of humanity. God has called us out of all humanity for a special purpose. That's what it means to be holy. That's what holy is. Holy isn't, well, I'm better than this guy over here. Holy is set aside. God called and set aside. That's what we are. And that's what, that's what he has done. We are not common people of humanity. God has a purpose and a calling on our life. Two, we will someday be king. And I believe that. I believe that with all my heart. When the kingdom comes fully, we will establish some form of rulership in that kingdom. Under him, obviously. But we will. And we'll look at those verses next week. And like them, this was our call from infancy. 
This is our call from infancy, and we must answer that call. We also need to be told who we are. Just as they, as they were growing up, we need to be, we need to know our identity. We need to know what our calling is. We need to know that God in heaven loved us so much that he called each and every one of us in our life to follow him and to serve him. We need to know. Our children need to have that assurance on their life. We as parents have to put it into the hearts of our children that they are in fact called by God. They're not just being raised in a religious home, but that God has a call on each one of their lives for a purpose, and he has equipped them for the edifying of the body. We need to instill this into our children. They can choose to be arrogant about it, or they can choose to be servants. Part of that will come about on how we reflect our attitudes toward them. We need to be taught, and we need to teach how to live according to God's word, according to his pattern. We need to learn and teach how to walk. There's a walk. There's a certain walk that God has for his people. And we've heard it before. Jacob had a certain walk after he had his encounter with the angel. The angel touched his hip, put it out of, out of place, and it says that Jacob limped after that. And Jacob had a certain walk, physically. And that's, that's kind of a neat spiritual picture of the fact that we as God's people should have a walk that's different than the rest of the world. That was different than when we weren't walking with him. See, if our walk hasn't changed after we become believers in Messiah, we better look at something because something didn't happen. Same with our talk. We need to learn how to talk. Because if our talk is the same now as it was before we came to faith, something's wrong. You see, we change. Everything changes. You know why? Because we die. The old man dies and we are raised new. Changes everything about us. We need to be taught how to think. We don't think as the world thinks. We don't think and process the way we used to. I have certain situations that come into my life now that came into my life when I was younger, before I became a believer. Do you guys, do any of you remember how you used to process things? Do you remember how you used to think? I... When I look at that now, I go, oh, I'm sorry, Lord. But I, I do remember having a certain process of how I thought through things and how I came to the conclusion of what matters ought to be. And I realized that that wasn't God's process because of what comes at the end, what the solution is. So our thought process has to change. And how we behave toward others. Just as these young men needed to be taught how they would behave toward others that were not quite as, as to do as they were, so to speak. How would they treat those who weren't able to, uh, wouldn't be able to reach their, their level of not just... Uh, not just royalty, but maybe financially, whatever. How would they treat those who are uh, more of a... And I, I'm, I'm struggling to find the word because it's not, it's not proper that they're less than they are as people. Uh, just of a less standing, so to speak. How do we treat others in those situations? How and what we eat. I'm sure they had a certain diet. How to sleep. The scripture has directions for all of these things for us. How to wear clothes. What clothes to wear. How much clothing to wear. What we watch. And not just TV or on the computer. 
but what we set before our eyes that we will gaze on and focus on. What we listen to and who from. There are many voices out there today. They've all got something to say. Who our friends are. Who is it that we draw closest to us? Who is it that we feel most uh, tied to? As future kings, these two boys, this was a big part of, of protecting them and guiding them. And who are our friends and who are our children's friends? And what our spouses must be like. I'm always amazed at how often I hear of believers marrying unbelievers. And what our social life must be like. What we do with our time. Not just who our friends are, but that which entertains us. What we set before us that, to entertain us. Now these are all issues that, that I want to address here in the next couple of weeks because there's a disconnect in our land. There's a disconnect of how the children of God are to live in the world that we're living in. As we wait for his return, as we wait for him to, to establish his kingdom, how are we busy? What are we, what are we accomplishing? What are we doing? And I venture to say that the church has gone astray as a whole. But as a whole is not my concern. My concern is right here and right here. Okay. Being a future king must encompass everything about us. Every decision that we make in life must be filtered through the realization of who we are. We're not just free folks to just make choices without really giving a lot of concern toward those choices. We have a call. We have a calling on our life. We have a God to proclaim to the world. And if our life is a mess, then we're not going to give a very good proclamation of who God is. You know, a lot of the people, you know, I, even, even years ago when I would talk to people about, you know, coming to church and giving their life, probably one of the number one reasons that when I would speak to people who just were not interested on any level, probably the, the number one reason, there could be some who had just had a bad deal, but the, the number one reason that I seem to remember hearing was is that they believe that the church is filled with hypocrites. And I don't believe our church is filled with hypocrites, but in the, in the, in the, in the big realm of what I see in Christianity today, I agree with them. But that shouldn't be the way it is. That should not be what it is. The scripture says, remember, that, that a, a, fruit, a tree does not bear good fruit and bad fruit. It does, it does not bear that. There is a cleaning up in Christianity that needs to take place. But you know what? That cleaning up has to begin with me, not with everybody else. You know, that, that's where it really needs to begin. And as I'm looking down through these, I'm looking and just kind of re realizing that, you know, this whole idea of being a child of God, Lord, have I really let it encompass me to the level that I should be letting it encompass me? In the job I take? You know, when I took a job of, of being the janitor and cleaning toilets and pumping ketchup for the kids, you know, I, I have to I honestly I have to tell you that I didn't really say, you know what, because I'm a child of the living God, a future king and priest within that kingdom, Abba, should I take this job? I have to honestly tell you, I didn't really search it out like that. I just simply said, 
well, this is a better job than the one I've got over here. And I knew that there would be some opportunities to witness to the kids, and I praise God for that. And over time, I do believe that God has me there. But that's not where I first came to him. Nor in many times have I ever come to him in situations where I'm going to buy a car. But I have, re I have remembered in certain situations where I have. And the issue is, is, you may buy a good car, you may buy a bad car, but the issue is, is, do we bring before the living God situations that we're in? That doesn't mean you wake up and go, well, should I wear these blue socks or should I wear these black socks? I'm not talking about that. Well, necessarily you could, but nevertheless, what I'm talking about is when we make our decisions that are going to carry us beyond a day, do we really look at those situations based on the fact that we're not our own? We're not our own. We belong to Him. And the decisions we make are going to reflect Him to other people. In short, we are chosen. We are not our own. And our future is set. We will be kings. And yet even now, we ourselves are also royalty. We're royalty because he made us royalty. We're royalty because he loves us so much that he sent his son to die for our sins. And, uh, but we need to claim that. We need to be able to walk in that. Next week we'll look at uh, putting that into more practical terms. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you for your time. I'll have the musicians come back up.